people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. A really good fight in the women's light flyweight division between former champion Evelyn Bermudez and unbeaten up-and-comer from Mexico, Tania Enriquez. A really good fight is an understatement. A good old Mexico versus Argentina rivalry set to go down in Buenos Aires, Argentina. You often hear about the classic Mexico versus Puerto Rico rivalries, but these days, Argentina... The Mexico versus Argentina rivalry is a bit of an underrated rivalry both women both world title challengers come from fighting families we know about the fighting bermudez sisters daniela bermudez roxana bermudez and evelyn bermudez tania enriquez comes from a fighting family as well her more well-known sister kenya enriquez one of the most devastating punchers in her prescribed weight class her younger sister tania is going to be vying for what are two of the four alphabet titles at this weight. This is for the newly vacated IBF and WBO titles, the two alphabet titles that Yocasta Valle won from Evelyn Bermudez in her last fight. They're up for grabs now that Yocasta has vacated the both of them. Powers that be saw it fit to give Evelyn Bermudez a shot at becoming a unified champion again. A more evenly matched contest would be hard to find than this one. Evelyn Bermudez, the former champion, the orthodox fighter opposite the ring, Tania Enriquez, the unbeaten up-and-comer, the Southpaw. Slight discrepancy in height. Tania is a little taller, maybe an inch or two taller than Evelyn Bermudez. Evelyn, Evelyn sports a professional record of 17 wins with one loss, just one loss, one draw, six knockouts. To Tania Enriquez, who sports an unblemished record of 20 wins, no losses, no draws, nine knockouts. Evelyn Bermudez will have home field advantage. This fight is set to go down in Buenos Aires, Argentina, her neck of the woods, but... Tania Enriquez to the eye, she's going to make Evelyn work for her money. These fighters, they have a lot in common. They both come from fighting families. They're both 26 years old. They're both mid-range to inside fighters. The both of them were busy last year. Tania Enriquez saw action three times last year. This will be her first fight of this year. Something very similar applies to Evelyn Bermudez. Evelyn Bermudez saw action four times, four times last year. Same applies. Will also be her first fight of this year, and they're kicking the year off with a bang opposite the ring each other. These are both action fighters. Sluggers that throw punches in bunches, though I have to say, having had my first look at Tania Enriquez in action. Gotta be honest here, I think her work is a little bit more neat and tidy, mid-range to inside, than what you get from Evelyn Bermudez. With Evelyn, beyond the straight one-two, from the outside coming in, the work gets messy in the pocket, whereas Tania, she's a bit more coordinated. Here you have two punchers that throw punches in bunches, but what you get from Evelyn is more frenzy. It's more manic and messy. You know, she throws punches in bunches, but her shot selection, it's not the best. Whereas what you get from Tania Enriquez... I really like her shot selection. There are a few things that separate them. I mean, both Daniela and Tania, they have a lot in common, but there are subtleties. There are nuances and shot selection. What punches are being thrown and whether or not they hit the target, that's one among them. Outside of the straight one, too, Evelyn Bermudez is very limited. Whereas Tania, she can show a jab right hand combination the same as Evelyn, but that's not all she's got in the toolbox. She is a bit of an accomplished body puncher. Just like her sister. Evelyn Bermudez not being a defensive wizard as she jabs her way into striking distance, it's conceivable that she could be on the receiving end of a lot of those body shots that Tania Enriquez likes to throw. Where Evelyn Bermudez's best punches are her straight punches, Tania's best punches are her bent arm punches, her hooks and her uppercuts and counter uppercuts. Body shots that if 
Evelyn Bermudez is looking for a war, stepping into her jab. She's going to find it opposite the ring to Nia Enriquez, who shows more countering ability, at least for my money, more counter punching than Evelyn does. Evelyn's approach is a lot more straightforward than what you get from Tania. I do feel like Tania manages the distance better than Evelyn Bermudez does. Evelyn, she smothers her work at times, stepping into her straight punches. Whereas Tania, to the eye, she manages the distance better and maintains a bit of space to really drive her punches, get uh... optimal leverage for her shots. Yeah, I think Tania has better feet than Evelyn Bermudez. This may prove to be an even tougher assignment for Evelyn Bermudez than Yo Costa Valle was. Yo Costa Valle, who won a points decision in their last fight. This is a bigger, stronger. Younger. Younger than Yo Costa, at least. Fresher fighter than Yo Costa Valle, who beat Evelyn on points in their last fight. I have to be honest, I don't think Evelyn Bermudez does a lot of things better than Tania Enriquez. Not to the eye, the saving grace. And what's working for Evelyn is that she'll have home field advantage, that the fight is going down in her neck of the woods. Outside of that, I think Tania has better feet, better shot selection, manages the distance better. More coordinated and not as frenzied as Evelyn Bermudez. I mean, at minimum, you have to come to the conclusion that Evelyn's got her work cut out for her. If you got beat by a minimum weight moving up the light flyweight, what's this girl gonna do to you? 20 and 0 with 9 KOs. Comes from a fighting family, the same as Evelyn. Mexico versus Argentina rivalry rages on. Set to go down in early March. We'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches. In men's lightweight and super lightweight news, an alarming tweet from Oscar De La Hoya that may herald trouble in paradise. Oscar tweeted, I have no contract. Deadline for me is Monday or I'm moving on. Hashtag Davis versus Garcia. There's a fly in the ointment. Now, last month, Showtime executive Stefan Espinoza posted a tweet that might provide some clarification as to what's actually going on here. Stefan Espinoza said, you can have a deal without a signed contract. Often, the contract isn't signed until fight week. Done deal and no signed contract can both be true. By the way, all parties, fighters, promoters, and the network signed off on the social media announcement by Tank and Ryan before it was made. It's not the first time I've heard that. That a deal for a fight can be finalized without the actual contract being signed. And the actual contract being signed usually happens at or around fight week. But if that's true, then why is Oscar De La Hoya giving them an ultimatum? Why is he giving them a Monday deadline? Some form of misdirection to pull Ryan out of a fight that he doesn't really want him to have due to the deal's structure, a fight that he perhaps feels right now is happening too soon. I mean, what's Oscar De La Hoya really up to? Because if the fight isn't set to go down until April, why would he expect to have a signed contract here and now? He knows how this works. This is some form of excuse, some form of ruse in order to pull Ryan out of this thing. Is he trying to sabotage the fight? The months of April and May, respectively, very busy months. We talked about that in a previous video. In April, you're supposed to be seeing Davis versus Garcia, but you're also supposed to be seeing Spence versus Thurman. Two box office fights happening in the same month on the same platform. If these two box office fights were coming to us by way of two separate promoters and two separate platforms, I could understand. I could see because then they're just competing with each other. Although that in and of itself is unwise, forcing the fight fans to have to make a choice. Two box office fights in the same month in proximity of each other isn't exactly a good thing. It's not good for the buy rate. That is more or less what Oscar De La Hoya was hinting at a few days ago when news broke that Spence versus Thurman would be happening the same month that Davis versus Garcia would be happening. That's what he was talking about. That's what he meant when he said, what's Al Heyman thinking? In April, they're supposed to be doing Ryan Garcia versus Javante Davis and Spence versus Thurman. The month of May is even worse. Now hearing news that Vasil Lomachenko versus Devin Haney may go down in the month of May as a box office fight, a pay-per-view, unless we forget in the month of May, Canelo Alvarez is supposed to be returning to action in what undoubtedly would be another box office fight. Another pay-per-view. If you were under the impression 
that they could simply push back Davis versus Garcia to happen later on in the year, say May. May is pretty full. Looks like there were going to be two pay-per-views going down in May. Tack on Davis versus Garcia, that makes three. Three box office fights happening in the same month ain't good for the buy rate of any of them. You're going to force fight fans to choose some of them. Not everybody's going to buy every single one of those fights. That would come out to roughly $240 on top of what they're already spending for their cable or their streaming apps. An additional $240 for three fights on top of what they are already spending. Needless to say, not everybody's going to fork over that cash. With piracy being at an all-time high and finding a pirated stream to watch a box office his fight for free being easier now than it ever was in previous eras of boxing. A lot of guys are going to steal it. A lot of fight fans would elect to watch some, if not all, of those fights by way of pirated streams instead of forking over that cash on the premise that the month of May would be a very expensive month to be a boxing fan. So pushing the fight back until the month of May, is that really an option? Doesn't look like it. I said it before, and I'll say it again. You know, Ryan Garcia versus Gervonta Davis and that announcement they made for that fight last year, it almost feels like false advertising, like we were all hoodwinked. What time progresses, the more I'd be surprised if that fight actually happens on schedule. What time passes, you go out of your way to make this big announcement for the Davis versus Garcia fight, a fight that wasn't done. It still isn't. It's exactly the way that Stefan Espinoza says it is, that a deal can be done without an actual signed contract, and the contracts don't actually get signed until fight week, then why is Oscar doing this? If that's true, then he must be trying to sabotage this fight. And he would have to be. He would have to be trying to sabotage this fight. For what reason? Well, I'll be honest, I always felt like... This deal got done a little bit too easy with not enough friction from Oscar. You know, Golden Boy Promotions, they ain't got that many marquee fighters, that many marquee guys. Ryan, I mean, they've got Zerto and they've got Virgil and William Zapata, but Ryan, Ryan really is the most popular one among them. And the idea that Oscar would just stand by, let Ryan go to showtime. Just like that. Given where Golden Boy Promotions is right now, can they really afford to let their star fighter, their golden goose, float over to another platform? They've never been the same since Canelo Alvarez left. Widespread rumors of a Golden Boy Promotions exodus. Many of their staff leaving the promotional outfit. Something about longtime matchmaker Roberto Diaz contract not being renewed with the promotional outfit. Things aren't looking good over there at Golden Boy Promotions. Not right now, and now is not the best time for their star fighter to have a major fight like this on the rival platform. I don't want them to fail, you understand. I'd prefer that the fight actually happen on schedule in April if it were up to me, but you'll excuse my skepticism. You'll excuse me for saying so that this entire situation wrapped itself up too easy for me from the get. Seemed too good to be true. Now Ask is talking about a Monday deadline for signed contracts? Is that common practice? Something ain't right. Finally, yet another bombshell revelation. This one coming to us by way of the men's super bantamweight and featherweight divisions. Salvador Rodriguez of ESPN stated, Brandon Figueroa versus Mark McSayo at the table for March 4th. Venue to be determined, uh, Mexico versus Philippines kind of fight. What makes that a bombshell? Well, well, if Brandon Figueroa is fighting Mark McSayo, that means he's not fighting Stefan Fulton. <laughs> Stefan Fulton for the second time. And if he's not fighting Stefan Fulton, that then means Stefan's not moving up. He may elect to stay in the men's super bantamweight division where he's in possession of two of the four major alphabet titles. So does this mean we're going to get Inui versus Fulton? No, no, it doesn't mean that. Now, yeah, Inoue made a formal announcement that he will be moving up in weight very soon. He's going to vacate all the titles that he won at 118 pounds and vie to become a champion at 122. He's already Stefan's mandatory challenger by way of the WBO. He's already in the queue. He's already there by way of his WBO super status he achieved by becoming undisputed champion at bantamweight. Up there at super bantamweight. Simple question. You think a fight like that involving two separate promotional outfits and two separate platforms, you think it goes down that easy? Is that what you think? No, yeah, you know it. Who in this part of the world is promoted by Top Rank. Top Rank has always had a way with the WBO. Coincidentally, he's already Stefan's mandatory challenger by way of the WBO. I would sooner expect Stefan Fulton 
to vacate the WBO title, but hang on to the green belt, hang on to the WBC title, and continue to campaign as a super bantamweight, not because he's actually going to fight now, yeah, you know it, but so that he can ride his coattails. You want to know what's really going on here? Then I can't pull no punches. Stephen Fulton is not a draw in America. He is nowhere near the draw in America that Naoya Inoue is in Japan. Moreover, Stephen Fulton isn't even making the waves in America that Naoya Inoue is. Naoya Inoue is widely accepted as a pound-for-pound -pound fighter, whereas Stephen Fulton... He's just the unified champion among several unified champions. Naoya Inoue is a four-division, undisputed ring magazine and lineal champion. What if I told you that Naoya Inoue is more popular in America than Stephen Fulton is? Not saying that either one of them is all that popular. Not saying that Naoya Inoue is Julio Iglesias out here. What if I told you that in the West, the West, the Naoya West, Inoue the West. is widely regarded as a pound for pound fighter, one of the best in the sport, whereas Stefan, Stefan Fulton, in the West. Oh, I know that you can probably find some tribalist content creators that'll tell you Stefan is a pound for pound fighter just because he beat Angelo Leo and Brandon Figueroa. But that view, however, is not widely accepted. In some ways, Naoya Inoue is already a more popular fighter in the West than Stefan is. Okay, get to the point. The point is that if Stefan Fulton is electing to stay in the super bantamweight division, I'd sooner believe it's so that he can ride Naoya Inoue's coattails than actually make a fight with him. Naoya Inoue's arrival to the men's super bantamweight division will garner it more exposure than it was getting before he got there. Stefan or his handlers, what they might want is for Stefan to ride Naoya Inoue's wave because up until now, now, the men's super bantamweight division wasn't getting that much attention to begin with. They might seek to promote Stefan Fulton's fights by way of name association, association with Naoya Inoue. They know that's a bit of a hot topic here and now, a conversation that is gaining some traction, but you tell me how much faith you have that the PBC will do what they have to do to make a fight with Inui. They won't. They have a hard enough time making their fighters fight each other, let alone someone else's fighters. They never made Leo Santa Cruz versus Gary Russell. They never made Jarrett Hurd versus Jermel Charlo. They are just now getting around to making Thurman versus Spence. They could have made that fight a long time ago. They are just now getting around to making Benavidez versus Plant. They could have made that fight a long time ago, back when they were both champions, unbeaten ones. They're just now getting around to doing that. You expect me to believe that they're gonna make Fulton versus Inui in a timely fashion? No, I expect issues. I expect friction. I'm expecting a smear campaign, a blame game. And I'd love to be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. There's enough evidence to the contrary. These guys are not in the business of making fights that the fight fans ask for. They're not. They're in the business of clout chasing and substitutes. Serving up substitutes in place for what the consumer wants. Alternatives. Instead of Benavidez versus Plant, what you got was Benavidez versus a bunch of no-hopers. Instead of Spence versus Crawford, what you're getting is Spence versus Thurman. Five or six years too late. Stop me when I tell a lie.